now, even though it's been. Okay, all right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you Thank for you being here. Mm, you're welcome. Shortly after we finish, actually, this has already happened to you because you're the advanced group. We emailed you the follow-up before the session. So you have the slides already sent to you from today. Um, and we were already recording. So really, I'm just here to say we're launching now our presentation, Lexington, Kentucky, Segregated by Design, How Our Past Laws and Choices Created a Segregated Community. In her 1993 inauguration poem, Maya Angelou said, history, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. Thank you for having the courage to face some Lexington history with us today. We are two white senior citizens who have both been concerned about racial justice for a long time. Barbara is a retired city employee and librarian. I'm a writer and researcher. During the summer of 2020, we began research about the responsibility white people like us bear for racism. We focused at first on learning about the case for national reparations, and we gradually gravitated toward learning the history of racism here in Fayette County. At the start, we need to tell you that our intention is to describe and acknowledge what has happened in Lexington. We do not concentrate on solutions or action steps at this point. This presentation includes key findings and examples from research we've conducted since June 2020. You can find more information and detail along with the resources we used at our website, segregatedlexington.com. We caution that this presentation includes excerpts from historical records that contain very disturbing language. We appreciate your willingness to face the information that is difficult to hear. In the course of our research, we came to understand residential segregation as a major cause of inequality in home ownership and the black white wealth gap. It is, a, it is a significant force that leads to inequities in work, health, education, political power, and just about every other facet of daily life. To provide national context for Lexington's history of segregation, we will share a short video called Segregated by Design. It is based on Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law. The video moves fast and you might want to make some notes, but you don't have to. You can watch it on your own whenever you like. After a short time to reflect on the video, we will share our findings about some of the ways that segregation by law, also called de jure segregation, operated in Lexington. We will play the video at maximum volume. So if you're using headphones, or earbuds, please adjust downward if you need to. Oh, sorry. Oh, uh, excuse me. In the middle of the 20th century, the city of St. Louis, Missouri, and the United States federal government condemned and demolished the neighborhoods of downtown St. Louis, where African Americans lived, displacing thousands. They built the Gateway Arch. They built a university, interstate highways, hospitals, and middle-class housing that was unaffordable to the former African American residents. Those who were displaced then relocated to the few other places available, converting inner ring suburbs like Ferguson into new segregated enclaves. We have been led to believe that racial segregation in housing was de facto segregation, 
by accident or the result of private prejudices. Yes, private prejudice clearly contributed to segregation, but by itself it could not have segregated the country without the intention of the federal government to segregate neighborhoods throughout the nation. If, however, we understand the accurate history, the history that was once well known, but we've all now forgotten, that racially segregated patterns in every metropolitan area like St. Louis were created by de jure segregation, racially explicit policy on the part of federal, state, and local governments designed to segregate metropolitan areas, then we can understand that we have an unconstitutional residential landscape. And if it's unconstitutional, then we have an obligation to remedy it. The federal government and the New Deal of the Roosevelt administration of the 1930s pursued policies in the mid 20th century that segregated metropolitan areas. One important policy was the first civilian public housing program, which frequently demolished integrated neighborhoods in order to create segregated public housing. In the late 1930s, another New Deal program, the United States Housing Authority, was adopted. The very first projects built under the United States Housing Authority authorization were in Austin, Texas, because the most aggressive proponent of public housing at that time was the congressman from Austin, Lyndon Baines Johnson. And Johnson got the United States Housing Authority to put its first projects in Austin, separate projects for whites, for African Americans, and the project for Hispanics. The project for African Americans was placed in a location that the city plan of Austin had designated as a ghetto for African Americans. The United States Housing Authority and the local Austin Housing Authority demolished something called Emancipation Park which was a celebrations location for the abolition of slavery. The design was to move all African-Americans in the city of Austin into this community, whether in public housing or in private housing. The city of Austin then began to close schools for African-Americans elsewhere in the city, to close libraries and other public facilities to force African-Americans to move to the east side. Another program that the federal government pursued to enforce segregation was the work of the Federal Housing Administration, the FHA, which subsidized the development of suburbs like Levittown, New York, on condition that they only be sold to white families and that the homes in those suburbs had deeds that prohibited resale to African Americans. The Federal Housing Administration's underwriting manual said that inharmonious racial groups should not be permitted to live in the same communities meaning that loans to African-Americans could not be insured. Government at all levels throughout the nation were involved in promoting and enforcing the restrictive deeds in homes and places like Levittown, and judges enforced the view that these deeds did not violate the Constitution because they were private agreements. Although white middle-class families that moved into suburbs like Levittown could buy property with no down payments if they were veterans and low-interest mortgages, Middle-class African-Americans had to make substantial down payments and get uninsured mortgages with higher interest rates. In many, if not most cases, African-Americans could not get mortgages at all because the federal government would not insure them. As a result, they bought their homes on contract, like an installment plan where they accumulated no equity and could be evicted from their homes in the event of a single missed payment. Thus, contract buyers did not have the option of leaving a declining neighborhood before their properties were paid for in full. If they did, they would lose everything they'd invested in that property to date. The term redlining comes from the federal government's creation of maps of urban areas nationwide. And those maps were color-coded to indicate where it was safe to insure mortgages. Anywhere African-Americans lived, even places where African-Americans lived nearby, were colored red to indicate to appraisers that these neighborhoods were too risky for the FHA to insure. The FHA's justification was that if African-Americans bought homes in white neighborhoods, or even if they bought homes near those neighborhoods, the property values of the homes they were insuring, the white homes they were insuring, would decline, and therefore their loans would be at risk. In 1940, for example, a Detroit builder was denied FHA insurance for a project that was near an African-American neighborhood. He then constructed a half-mile concrete wall, six feet high and a foot thick, separating the two neighborhoods, and then the FHA approved the loan. In the three decades during which it administered this policy, however, 
the agency never provided or obtained evidence to support its claim that integration undermined property values. In fact, often racial integration caused property values to increase because African Americans' housing supply was so restricted and they had so many fewer choices. If African Americans had access to housing throughout metropolitan areas, supply and demand balances would have kept their rents and home prices at reasonable levels. Without access, landlords and sellers were free to take advantage of the greater demand relative to supply for African American housing. A 1946 National Magazine article described the Chicago building where the landlord had divided a 540 square foot storefront into six cubicles, each housing a family. He had similarly subdivided the second story. Total monthly rent was as great as that generated by a luxury apartment on Chicago's Gold Coast along Lake Michigan. Such exploitation was possible only because public policy denied African Americans opportunities to participate in the city's white housing market. As the federal government concentrated low-income African Americans in single neighborhoods, the homes became overcrowded. Families had to subdivide their homes to make their mortgage payments and their property tax payments. Cities frequently withdrew public services from African American neighborhoods. They collected garbage less frequently. They didn't provide water and sewer services. Polluting industry and toxic waste plants were placed in African American communities in order to protect white neighborhoods from deterioration. The result was that African American neighborhoods frequently turned into slums. White homeowners looked at these places and assumed that slum conditions were characteristics of African Americans, not of government policy that forced this kind of overcrowding. White homeowners then became resistant to African Americans moving into their neighborhoods because they thought they would bring slum conditions with them. Of course, the slums were not created by the people. They were created by the forced concentration, the overcrowding in these neighborhoods. Blockbusting was a scheme in which speculators bought properties in borderline black-white areas, rented or sold them to African-American families at above market prices, persuaded white families residing in these areas that their neighborhoods were turning into African-American slums and that values would soon fall precipitously, and then purchased the panicked white homes for less than their worth. Blockbuster's tactics included hiring African-American women to push carriages with their babies through white neighborhoods, hiring African-American men to drive cars with radios blasting through white neighborhoods, or making random telephone calls to residents of white neighborhoods and asking them to speak to someone with a stereotypically African-American name, like Johnny May. State licensing agencies that regulated real estate agents could have easily stopped this practice. All they had to do was to lift the license of one or two real estate agents who engaged in these practices, and the practices would have ended. While many de jure segregation policies aim to keep African Americans far from white residential areas, public officials also shifted African American populations away from downtown business districts so that white commuters, shoppers, and business elites would not be exposed to black people. This was accomplished with slum clearance, one slum clearance tool was the construction of the federal interstate highway system. In many cases, state and local governments, with federal acquiescence, signed interstate highway routes to destroy urban African-American communities. In the 1950s, there was a white middle-class neighborhood in Los Angeles that wealthy African-Americans began to move into. It was called Sugar Hill. The first thing that happened was that the Neighborhood Association got together and tried to buy out the African-American families who were moving in, offering them more money than the African-Americans had paid in order to get them out of the neighborhood. When that didn't work, white homeowners tried to enforce a legal agreement prohibiting them from living in the neighborhood. And when that didn't work, the city council then decided it would be an African-American neighborhood. It rezoned it for multiple family housing. It eventually became a slum, and then the Santa Monica Freeway was built to clear that slum to destroy the neighborhood. So these policies all worked together in an unconstitutional <laughs> fashion to segregate Los Angeles. In 1957, Bill and Daisy Myers were able to purchase a home in Levittown, Pennsylvania, the Levitt Company's second large development. When the mail carrier discovered that he was delivering mail to an African-American family, he let everyone in the neighborhood know, and as many as 600 white demonstrators soon showed up in front of the Myers' house, 
pelting the family in their home with rocks. Law enforcement stood by as this happened. For two months, rocks were thrown, crosses were burned, the Ku Klux Klan symbol was painted on the wall next door. Some policemen stood with the mob, joking and encouraging its participants. One sergeant was actually demoted to patrolman because he objected to orders he had been given not to interfere with the rioters. In 1951, World War II veteran Harvey Clark, his wife Janetta, and two small children rented an apartment in Little White Cicero, a suburb of Chicago. When the Clarks refused to leave, a mob of 4,000 rioted, raiding the apartment, destroying the fixtures, and throwing the family's belongings out the window onto the lawn where there were seven layers. Time magazine reported that the police officers present, quote, acted like ushers politely handling the overflow of the football stadium, unquote. The only people that the grand jury indicted were Harvey Clark, his real estate agent, his NAACP attorney, and the white landlady who rented the apartment to him, as well as her attorney, on charges of inciting a riot and conspiring to lower property values. Stories like this were commonplace and state-sponsored violence was a means, along with many others, by which all levels of government maintain segregation. Today, African-American incomes are about 60% of white incomes. But African-American wealth is about 10% of white wealth. Most middle-class families in this country gain their wealth from the equity they have in their homes. So this enormous difference between a 60% income ratio and a 10% wealth ratio is almost entirely attributable to federal housing policy implemented through the 20th century. African-American families that were prohibited from buying homes in the suburbs in the 1940s and 50s, and even into the 60s by the Federal Housing Administration, gained none of the equity appreciation that whites gained. Across the country in new developments, these homes in the late 1940s and 1950s sold for about twice national median income. They were affordable to working class families with an FHA or VA mortgage. African Americans were equally able to afford those homes as whites, but were prohibited from buying them. Today, those homes sell for 300,000 to 400,000 at the minimum, six to eight times national median income. The white families sent their children to college with the wealth they gained from appreciating home equity. They were able to take care of their parents in old age and not depend on their children. They were able to bequeath wealth to their children. None of those advantages grew to African Americans, who for the most part were prohibited from buying homes in the suburbs. So in 1968, we passed the Fair Housing Act that said, in effect, okay, African Americans, you're now free to buy homes in the suburbs that had been forbidden. But it's an empty promise because those homes are no longer affordable to the families whose parents or grandparents could have afforded them when whites were buying into those suburbs and gaining the equity and wealth that followed from their purchases. Consider children who come from families where they're economically stressed or in poor health because they have no access to good health care or because they live in polluted environments. When they do come to school, for example, they may suffer from asthma because of that pollution and are drowsy from being awake at night wheezing. They cannot then typically achieve at levels of children who come to school well rested. When you concentrate children like that in single classrooms, it's impossible for teachers to develop the kind of outcomes that they can in middle class children who come to school healthy, unstressed, and able to pay attention to schooling. What economists know is that African-American children from low-income families who grow up in segregated neighborhoods are less likely as adults to move into the middle class than are African-American children whose families have the same low incomes but who live in integrated neighborhoods. So segregation itself impedes intergenerational mobility and perpetuates, rigidifies the inequality that we experience. Another thing that social psychologists have discovered is that decision-making is hampered when you don't have diverse decision-making groups. These psychologists have done experiments where they put people together to solve problems in both diverse groups and in segregated groups. And the diverse groups are much better able to solve problems because they challenge assumptions much more than the segregated groups do. So segregation impedes our political and economic success. <laughs> 
we have three provisions in the federal constitution that prohibit the kinds of actions that federal, state, and local governments pursued to create residential segregation. One is the Fifth Amendment, which requires the federal government to treat all citizens fairly. Another is the 14th Amendment that requires state and local governments not only to treat citizens fairly, but to treat them equally. And then the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, also requires that we banish the effects of slavery, which Congress long ago determined was any form of second-class citizenship. So in fact, the prohibition on African Americans to purchase homes in federally subsidized white communities for the segregation of public housing created a form of second-class citizenship, which was a violation of the 13th Amendment. We cannot reverse the jury segregation, mainly with lawsuits. We must also build a national political consensus leading to legislation, a challenging but not impossible task. Our focus now should be to develop policies that promote an integrated society, understanding it will be impossible to fully untangle the web of unconstitutional inequality that we've woven. To begin, we should first contemplate what we have collectively done and on behalf of our government, accept responsibility to fix it. Please take a couple of minutes to reflect and make any notes you would like about the video. We will invite conversation about all of this at the end of our presentation in about 25 minutes. As you reflected on the video, you probably asked yourself whether it applies to Lexington. Based on our research, the two of us believe the answer is a definite yes. Here in Lexington, government and private interests, segregated communities, denied home ownership opportunities to African Americans, destroyed some black neighborhoods, and put others in jeopardy. They did this in some of the same ways described in the video racially restrictive covenants, redlining, realtor steering, certain planning and zoning practices, and urban renewal. Now we'll share some examples of how these segregating forces operated here in Lexington. We begin with racially restrictive covenants. A racially restrictive covenant when written into a property deed prohibited the buyer from selling or renting the property to people of a specified race. In Lexington, the restrictive covenants most often singled out African Americans. These covenants were most prevalent in the first half of the 20th century. As Lexington expanded outward, black and white families had radically different opportunities. White people had an enormous array of new home choices, while Black families were largely excluded from developing areas. The language of restrictive covenants can be shocking, as you will see from the examples we are sharing. This one concerns Goodrich Avenue, which is near Southland Drive. In 1927, all the property owners on Goodrich Avenue signed an agreement saying that no property on Goodrich could ever be sold or leased to any Negro or any association of Negroes, nor shall any Negro or association of Negroes 
be permitted to occupy said property, but this shall not inhibit any owner or lessee from having their Negro servants remain on said property. Hmm. This example from, is from Liberty Heights subdivision off Winchester Road. It says, none of this property to be owned by, occupied by, or leased to a Negro. And if it is, the title to revert to the original owner. Some restrictive covenants only affected individual homes, but we found many covenants that applied to entire subdivisions. This example is from a 1921 deed for a property on Victory Avenue off Richmond Road in a subdivision then called Beachland, which later became part of Kenwick. You may wonder if your neighborhood has racially restrictive covenants, quite possibly, if your neighborhood was developed before 1948. After that, the Supreme Court ruled that the covenants were unenforceable here you can see neighborhoods where we are sure restrictive covenants applied. Liberty Heights, Kenwick, Mintel Park, Hollywood Terrace, Forest Park, Suburban Court, Goodrich, and Rosemill. By sampling deeds at the county clerk's office, we became convinced that restrictive covenants were widespread in Lexington until the mid 20th century. We looked at deeds in neighborhoods we thought could have been affordable and appealing to working families, including black working families. We selected individual houses more or less at random within each neighborhood. We found restrictive covenants in every neighborhood we studied. Finding every restrictive covenant in a city would be a huge project. And yet some cities are doing that work either with volunteers or using city resources. Three cities we know about are Minneapolis, Seattle, and Richmond, Virginia. A lot more people will have to do a lot more work if Lexington would like to join those cities. We hope that will happen so we can all learn more about how the covenants affected settlement patterns in Lexington. So who was responsible for our city's restrictive covenants? As we know from the video we just saw, the government played a huge role. The Federal Housing Authority often required restrictive covenants as a condition for insuring loans. The property recording office and the courts maintained the records and enforced the covenants. Individual property sellers and buyers created or at least accepted the covenants. The same is true for real estate agents, banks, and lawyers who took part in the sales. In 1948, the Supreme Court ruled restrictive covenants unenforceable. Seven decades later, the covenant's ugly legacy lives on. Restrictive covenants furthered segregation patterns that continue to this day. Lexington residents, white and black, lost decades of experience in creating a diverse, welcoming community. White families bought homes in deed-restricted neighborhoods all through the decades leading up to 1948 and continued to build equity in those homes. Black families who could not buy similar homes had fewer housing choices and almost no opportunities to build equity, an important cause of the ongoing wealth gap. We've just shown how government and private interest perpetuated segregation in Lexington through restrictive covenants. Our next topic is redlining, in which government played an even more significant role. As we saw in the video, redlining is the practice of denying home loans in particular neighborhoods based on race. The Federal Housing Authority, FHA, was the main perpetrator. The FHA insured home loans made by banks and other private lenders to white home buyers while refusing to do the same for black home buyers. FHA appraisers made lending decisions using color-coded maps and a bias-filled instruction book for appraisers called the Underwriting Manual. We can't show you the FHA redlining map for Lexington because nearly all the FHA maps disappeared around 1970. The map you see here was from another Depression-era agency, the Home Owners Loan Corporation, or HOLC. 
That agency loaned money to people who had mortgages but were in danger of defaulting. The Hulk maps divided cities into four grades based on several factors, including race. The FHA made its maps just a few years later and used similar criteria, so many people who study redlining think the maps were probably similar. We still can't pinpoint Lexington's exact FHA redlining boundaries, but we know there was redlining here because it was national FHA policy. A few FHA maps did survive, like this one from Chicago. As we can see, it also divided cities into color-coded classes, A through D. The FHA insured mortgages of 25, 20, or 10 years in classes A through C, but no mortgages at all in class D, which included most African-American neighborhoods. As for the underwriting manual, it actually required restrictive covenants and it ruled out loans in integrated neighborhoods and even areas where African-Americans live nearby. The manual directed appraisers to determine whether so-called incompatible social and racial groups lived near a location in order to predict whether those groups would quote, invade the location. This was based on the belief that neighborhood stability depended on a resident being in quote, the same social and racial classes on residents being in the same social and racial classes. As a result of language like this, along with denial of loans in redlined areas, African-Americans were unlikely to get FHA loans in either black, white, or integrated neighborhoods. The FHA's low down payments enabled many white families to buy homes for the first time and its long-term mortgages compared to the five-year terms that were typical until then resulted in lower monthly payments. All of this provided a huge economic benefit, but only for white families. After World War II, the GI Bill offered similar benefits to veterans. The GI Bill itself did not exclude African Americans, but it was run at the state and local level, so local laws and prejudices determined who would get benefits. There's considerable evidence that many, perhaps even most, Black veterans were excluded from benefits. As we saw in the video segregated by design, the FHA-backed loans subsidized whole new subdivisions. The new, sub, the new suburbs, which were expanding rapidly in the late 1940s, had to comply with the underwriting manual so they could not be integrated. Thus, suburban development provided more home choices to whites, but denied those choices to blacks. During the 16 years of rapid suburban expansion <clears throat> after the end of World War II, more than 15,000 new home lots became available in Lexington. Black families had access to 176 of those, which is 1.1%. In 1968, the Fair Housing Act made redlining illegal, but its impacts continue today. Most homes that white working families bought during the redlining period have appreciated many times over by now. The increased home equity has provided benefits that are continuing to move through generations of white families, but many black families who were denied FHA benefits during a crucial period in our country's financial history have never been able to catch up. This difference is an important cause of the huge gap in wealth between black and white families. According to a 2019 Federal Reserve report, the typical black family had 12 cents per $1 of white wealth. And most of our neighborhoods remain segregated. Black and white families still don't live together as neighbor, neighbors and friends. Segregation, keeps us separate and mistrustful of each other. Now we consider some planning and zoning practices in Lexington that added to neighborhood inequities and resulted in even more entrenched segregation. When Lexington adopted its first zoning ordinance in 1930, its stated purpose included promoting the public wealth, health, 
safety, morals, or the general welfare. But in practice, the ordinance offered fewer protections to black and low-income Lexingtonians than to middle-class whites. Several of Lexington's African-American neighborhoods began as settlements created after the Civil War when landowners sold lots to formerly enslaved people. Many of those lots were near railroads, dumps, or industrial sites. The 1930 zoning ordinance grandfathered in these and other existing uses without taking into account how unhealthy some of these uses were. The ordinance also created industrial zones in or next to some predominantly African-American residential areas. And as we have seen, laws and policies had already placed severe restrictions on African-Americans choice of place to live, places to live. Thirty-seven years after the first zoning ordinance was adopted, many unhealthy uses were still in place. We know this from a 1967 planning commission report called Neighborhood Analysis for 13 Low Standard Planning Units. The 13 neighborhoods highlighted here in dark yellow included the areas where most African Americans lived. The report cited problems such as warehouses so close to residences that they deprived families of light and air, industrial and heavy commercial activities next to residences, and more. In fact, the report listed planning choices and incompatible land uses affecting all of the 13 neighborhoods it labeled low standard. Here is how one unhealthy situation looked. As you see, there is no separation between an auto junkyard and occupied homes in Davistown, one of the 13 neighborhoods the Planning Commission cited in the 1967 report. This particular situation continued at least until this 1980 photograph. Our zoning regulations have also contributed to segregation by separating homes of different size and density. Intentionally or not, such regulations make it less likely that people of different incomes, family size, and other life circumstances will be neighbors. This separation has been part of our community zoning for so long that most of us tend to think it is essential to the character of our neighborhoods and the only way communities can be organized. As if the forces and factors we have already described weren't sufficient to keep Lexington segregated, for decades, realtors steered home buyers away from neighborhoods that didn't match their race. Starting in 1924, the National Realtors Code of Ethics said a realtor should not help introduce into a neighborhood, quote, members of any race or nationality whose presence will clearly be detrimental to property values in that neighborhood. Lexington Realtors followed this policy as the following examples demonstrate. We don't have photos of specific Lexington Realtors engaged in racial steering, but we can share a couple of stories that provide evidence. In an oral history interview, Dr. James W. Hammonds, a successful African-American doctor, said that in the early 1960s, he spoke with the president of the Lexington Real Estate Board about open housing. The president said, I just think you all are moving too fast. In the 1960s, sociologist Dr. Joseph Scott moved to Lexington with his family to become the first black professor at the University of Kentucky. Ben Story, a white realtor, represented the Scots in their search for a house. Their first offer, a house on Shady Lane, was refused because of their race. The Scots then found a home, found a home in the new all white suburb of Cardinal Valley and became Lexington's first black home buyers in a white suburban neighborhood. After the sale, their realtor Ben Story heard vocal criticism from other realtors. One contemporary account called it an incredible amount of abuse and he received anonymous threats. In the mid 1960s, 
O.M. Travis Jr., a prominent African-American real estate and insurance broker, applied for membership in the Lexington Board of Realtors twice. His application was denied both times. Mr. Travis believed the board denied his membership to prevent him from using a crucial membership benefit, access to the multiple listing service of all available homes for sale. Without access to the multiple listing service, Mr. Travis could not show his clients all their home buying options, including homes in all white areas of town. He was finally admitted to the Board of Realtors on his third application in 1973, after passage of the Fair Housing Act. In 1968, the Fair Housing Act made racial steering illegal. 10 years later, in 1978, and again in 1987, the Kentucky Commission on Human Rights studied racial steering in Lexington using trained white and black testers. In 1978, they found discrimination by realtors or apartment managers in two out of three cases. That rate declined in 1987, but was still 38%, more than one third of cases. We are not aware of studies about racial steering by realtors in Lexington since that time. By 1974, the National Association of Realtors had changed its code of ethics to require fairness instead of denying it. In 2020, they apologized for past racist practices, including steering. In 1979, the Lexington Board of Realtors made an agreement with the NAACP and Fair Housing Council. The board committed to train real estate agents about fair housing law and to recruit realtor board members from underrepresented populations. Although steering is no longer realtor policy and is in fact illegal, the impacts of past steering are still felt today. Steering contributed to the huge gap in homeownership between black and white Lexington families and to ongoing segregation of our neighborhoods. When we say segregation is ongoing, this is what we mean. This table shows a measure of segregation called the dissimilarity index. It is complicated and we explain it in more detail on our website. The short version is that a higher number means greater segregation. In Lexington, segregation has gone up and down over the decades, but never has been less than 42%. In fact, according to a recent State of Kentucky report, segregation in Lexington went back up between 2010, excuse me, 2010, well, that's the same thing, isn't it, <laughs> and 2017. The legal segregation of the past meant that Black families could not legally live where they chose. In fact, Black families in Lexington were essentially confined to a few neighborhoods until the late 1960s. Some of these already constrained areas became the main focus of so-called slum clearance or urban renewal, which we will talk about next. In the video, we saw examples of the massive urban renewal efforts some cities carried out destroying entire African-American communities. Lexington's efforts did not reach that scale, but did damage neighborhoods and uproot many residents. We will talk very briefly about five neighborhoods that were targeted for destruction or major changes. Formerly enslaved people settled both Adamstown and Crawltown shortly after the Civil War. Later, the University of Kentucky moved to the field between the two neighborhoods. From 1939 to 1943, the university acquired and completely demolished Adamstown to build Memorial Coliseum, primarily a basketball arena. Crawltown was threatened with destruction in the 1960s when the city proposed to move most families out and demolish their houses to provide land for private industry, UK, and the College of the Bible. The residents organized and defeated the project. But Prawl Town still faces challenges. Commercial landlords now own much of the housing, and UK students 
occupy many of the rental spaces. The East End served for many years as the heart of African-American life in Lexington. In 1960, the city planned to demolish homes and businesses in a 76 acre section with no workable plan to resettle people who lived there. Organized East End residents won community support and stopped the project. 20 years later, a new project developed with some resident participation demolished most of DeWeese Street and yielded a four lane road, Elm Tree Lane, that divides the neighborhood. That project did include improved sidewalks and sewers and renovation of the Lyric Theater. It also set in motion the suburban style redevelopment of a former urban black settlement known as Kincaid Town. South Hill and Davistown were two of Lexington's few integrated neighborhoods. In the 1970s, the Lexington Center Corporation with city approval demolished a three block section of modest but livable homes in South Hill to create parking for Rep Arena. Highly organized neighborhood and community opposition plus legal challenges failed to stop the destruction. As for Davistown, a planned road extension right through the community took decades to implement and may have worsened landlords and owners neglect of housing maintenance. Oliver Lewis Way, an extension of Newtown Pike finally opened in 2017. It fundamentally changed the neighborhood and more changes are yet to come. Each early attempt at urban renewal re revealed starkly different interests among white leaders and neighborhood residents, most of whom were black. As we have seen, living spaces were already limited for African-American families and clearance projects made matters worse. Even more housing would have been lost if residents hadn't thwarted some projects. The demolished neighborhoods were not just rows of houses, they were communities where people felt a sense of belonging and many families had lived for generations. Even where residents were able to preserve their communities, they had to invest enormous amounts of time and energy to do so. Only in Davistown and the second East End project did project planners attempt to replace housing and rebuild a semblance of community. Since we finished watching Segregated by Design, we have shared the outlines of our research on segregated housing in Lexington. The two of us have concluded that Lexington has been segregated by design, that is intentionally, and that segregation both continues and continues to matter today. To document that changes in laws have not yet resulted in the intended changes in lives, we will sum up our key points. 1948 and 1968 are crucial dates for legal changes. The Supreme Court ruled restrictive covenants unenforceable in 1948. 20 years later, the, the passage of the Fair Housing Act made redlining and realtor steering illegal. What is true today though, is that segregation continues. The gap in median wealth between blacks and whites has not narrowed in decades. Nationally, the home ownership gap between blacks and whites is worse in 2022 than in 1960. In 2018, for the 50th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act, Art Crosby of the Lexington Fair Housing Council was asked how far we've come in achieving the goals of the Fair Housing Act. Here's a portion of what he said. After 50 years of segregation, we seem to have accepted how things are because it seems like that is how things have always been. These racially segregated neighborhoods, however, did not organically happen over time because of personal preferences. They were created through a systemic process to isolate wealth and opportunities from one race over another. Ongoing race-based gaps in wealth continue virtually unchanged. In a 2018 study for the Minneapolis Federal Reserve, 
Researchers said the historical data reveal that no progress has been made in reducing income and wealth inequalities between black and white households over the past 70 years. Ongoing race-based gaps in, oh, sorry. Race-based gaps in home ownership continue. Lexington's black households own their own homes at less than half the rate of white households. As Richard Rothstein says at the end of Segregated by Design, undoing the effects of de jure segregation will be incomparably difficult. To make a start, we will have to contemplate, we'll first have to contemplate what we've collectively done. And on behalf of our government, accept responsibility to fix it. At this point in most slideshows or presentations like this, you probably would expect us to say, okay, therefore we, here's what we should do. And of course, Mr. Rothstein um, has said what he thinks we should do. Um, Barbara and I have concentrated on, some, on a different aspect of that. And Barbara, I'm gonna ask you to speak about that. You know, Rona, I'm sorry, I don't have that. I okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so I'll just say that what we have um, what we have thought from the beginning is that learning about and sharing with white people an accurate history of Lexington's um, history with race with with segregation is an action that we need to start with and then move toward acknowledgement. We've got more to say about this. We say it on our website, and I've included a link also in the. Um, follow-up materials that you got before the presentation. So at this point, we just want to thank you for your participation. And um, we have a few minutes for questions and conversation. Actually, question, I say it says questions and conversation. We're not sure we can answer questions, but we would be interested in your um, response to questions like these, what information in the presentation was new to you? How would you describe segregation in Lexington today? How would you describe it? What's your reaction to the presentation and information? And what aspects of this presentation matter most to you? And I will, I will let us see each other. Hello, everyone. Hello, people we didn't say hi to before. Hi, Bob. Gary I'm Johnson. Hi, hi. Bob Brown, Jeff Fryman. Hi. Thank you. Lila Raymond and Tom Parsons. Great. I'm going to stop the recording. We don't need to record this part.